Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Wusop. Oh, I'm already on my second slide. There you go. So what today we'll be talking about is how to build a fault-tolerant software uh, when, you're when your platform is depending on a lot of less uh, available components. So a lot of what we talked about today already is how can we leverage Kubernetes and, and, other, uh, and other tools to help uh, set up your, your infrastructure, how to make sure you have self-healing, how to make sure your internal failures are being accounted for. The idea is that a lot of the tools out there today, as uh, we're, we're moving in a world of interconnected web, rely on other tools to be available online. And uh, it becomes more and more important that we build software that is accounting for uh, faults from providers it's depending on. Uh, so th this work has, is inspired by a lot of what we do at Shippo. Shippo is a is an API that allows you to connect to a lot of uh, carrier APIs. So if you want to buy labels from FedEx or USPS to, create, to send your shipments, you only have to integrate our API and we'll connect you to hundreds, sorry, tens at this point of, of carriers where you can uh, print, labels, print labels to ship globally. We also connect a lot of platforms to help your fulfillment needs. So if you want to send information to your customers where uh, once a label is printed and is, is on the way, they can get tracking updates. We'll also connect to those platforms. So between carriers and, and shopping platforms and, and merchant platforms, we have hundreds of, of, of uh, platforms that we're connecting to. And uh, any downtime with those platforms could affect our system. So um, we had a lot of work to do in this department. So again, my name is Wusam. I'm an engineer at Chippo. I started off as a security engineer uh, uh, on, on the box security team. Really loved it. I uh, got a chance while I was there to work with the SRE team. I had a great SRE team. I got a, le a lot to learn from them. And um, ever since I fell in love with uh, DevOps philosophy, I, call I like calling it the philosophy because uh, all software engineers should be you know, in the habit of deploying their codes uh, from the first line all the way to production. Um, and if uh, things don't work out for me, um, my plan B has always been to join the NBA, although I'm not sure I'm in shape anymore for that. Uh, anyway. Love coconut water as well. Highly recommend it to get it fresh uh, if, you ever, if you ever make a trip to, to Hawaii. Cool. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about the problem. The problem, as I mentioned, is um, you're, you're a service provider, and you rely on uh, tens or so of third-party providers to uh, provide the functionality that you offer for the customers. So in our case, if any of the carriers that we de depend on are, is down or any of the merchant platforms is down, uh, we simply can't. Um, fulfill our client's needs. A minute of downtime on, at, at Shippo means, you know, imagine you're, a, you're checking out on Amazon, all of a sudden you're trying to get the shipping rates, and uh, you, don't get, you can't get those. Or Amazon obviously sometimes includes some of those prices, but any of your other merchant favorite uh, online store, uh, imagine you simply uh, got to check out and you got stuck there. You're never buying from them again, right? So it's a really big deal to make sure uh, we get this right for our customers. And um, here's, here's the gist of the problem. Just, just very simply put, you start off with uh, you know, your client trying to use your service. Your service is offering is guaranteeing your client four nines of uptime. This is a little ambitious, but let's, uh, let's go with that. Um, at a point where you're depending on only two third-party providers, if you're saying you might be down for one minute for each minute, either of them is down, you really need both of them to be up for four nines as well, which is quite a bit to ask out of a lot of the third-party providers that are outdated out there and working with legacy infrastructure, but maybe it's something you can work with. However, as you try to integrate more and more third parties, you'll notice that this number starts to quickly go up. So four nines is 4.2 minutes. Uh, this is almost five nines, which is a little less than half a minute. So it becomes really, really difficult. And this is only for eight providers. You go up to 16, you go up to 32. Now it's becoming impossible to rely on your third-party providers to stay up as much as you need them to, to make sure that you are also up for your customers. So this is where you have to get a little creative and um, figure out what you need to do. So let's, let's talk about the solutions. As, as we're talking about the solutions, let's first see what the industry has, what are the first things we've done in the industry to kind of address this problem. Um, as you can see here, you know, obviously, uh, you have a load balancer that's load balancing your client's request to a bunch of front-end workers. And one of the main things we've done in the industry is uh, we've isolated the work of processing the request from the work of talking to third-party providers. So front-end workers are queuing up uh, the work for the uh, back-end workers that are in turn responsible for, for uh, communicating with the third-party providers. You can assume that you have um, 
some timeouts on how you know w if the third party provider is taking a long time to uh, respond, you can assume you have a. I, I, I was very specific here. I put in a connect timeout and read timeout just because they actually you know, can be very helpful to separate. So let's say a total of just over eight seconds timing out when sending requests to a third party provider. Uh, well, you know, this helps. Obviously, it'll mitigate. You, know, you don't have to wait 30 seconds for requests and you manage your resources. Uh, but it's still not, not enough. And the reason being is that in this setup, usually you have a setup such that all of your background workers can talk to all third party providers. Now, remember, the premise of this service is that one can buy, in Shippo's instance, the label from uh, FedEx or USPS. I, you know, not to name specific areas, I don't want to uh, put anybody in a bad light, but you know, for, for, um, the idea is that if I want to buy a label from FedEx, uh, or USPS, if one of them is down, I should still be able to buy a label from the other. But with this simple architecture, this is actually not enough. Because if one third party provider goes down, now all of your background workers are actually stuck processing requests for that third party provider. And at this point, you don't have any more resources where you can process requests to the other third party provider. So that's becoming problematic uh, to your client. N now you're actually more down than if your client had integrated the good, the healthy third party provider, excuse me the health of third party provider directly. Uh, so what is the first thing you do? It's actually very simple. If it's a, you know, once you see that diagram, you say, oh, okay, well, all we have to do is separate, separate out. So now if a third party provider is down, um, only the dedicated resources for that third party provider will be affected. And here's why that's okay. You know, with today's uh, infrastructure as code tools, Kubernetes, uh, Terraform, this is actually not that very difficult to instrument. You could easily set up, uh, you know, if you're using a queuing mechanism, you could easily set up a broker and a new queue for all your new workers for each provider that you integrate. So this gives you great granularity to control how your resources are being spent. And couple that with auto-scaling auto techniques, you're not really uh, wasting any resources. So one could say, well, suppose most of my requests are going to this provider and none of them are going to this provider. Well, very simple, that's just auto-scale and it'll solve the problem for you. Cool, well, we can still do a little bit better than that because you know, there's one thing between a third party being down and um, it's just being slow. If it's being slow, we're happy just sp you know, spending some resources to kind of make sure um, we process all these requests. But if the part is actually completely down and we know this, then we actually don't want to spend any of these resources. Matter of fact, it's probably hurtful for us to keep sending requests to the third party because they're probably down a lot of times because they're having to process too many requests. So if anything, we want to help and retract some of our own requests. So how can we do this? So you know, the concept behind this is just simply to fail fast. You already know the provider is, is down, so you could respond to your customer and let them know, well, this carrier is down. You can't buy a label from them at the moment. You could buy a label from X, Y, and Z. Uh, and the way to do this is, um, so again, this is the same diagram. The idea is that how could we just save the resources uh, over here. Uh, the way to do this is using circuit breakers. So this is a picture of the circuit breaker in my house. And the idea is that anytime the current in the circuit is going too high, uh, the circuit breaker en engages and opens the circuit. This way it's making sure that uh, the electricity system is, is not too dangerous. And we can do this, use the same technique in software and in, 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 uh, in architecture where um, where what we do is once we realize that a provider has had too many errors, we simply stop sending requests to it until it recovers. Once it recovers, we're, uh, we're sending requests again. And that's what this would look like. So the circuit breaker starts off in the connected state. In the connected state, it's informing your application that the provider is good, you, know, you can send all the requests that you need to it. I, um, at some point, a third party provider is exceeding some configurable threshold that you've set up for error rates, where uh, it's responding with 500, it's simply timing out all the time. Uh, at that point, whatever is your configurable threshold, the um, circuit breaker switches to offline, disconnects, and now it's informing your application to stop sending requests. So what this means is that, let's, let me go back quickly to this slide. This means that at this point, your front end already knows that it doesn't need to queue up any work. All it needs to do is respond to the user and ask, ask you know, suggest that maybe the user uses a, a different provider or that they try again at a later time. Obviously, depending on your product, there are a lot of other things that you can do to get creative. You know, we'll, we'll touch on that in a second. So 
once uh, the circuit breaker is in the offline state, you can configure it to do uh, some pinging health checks, which is something we talked about earlier uh, for setting up your Kubernetes uh, swarm. Uh, you could actually use this for anything that, that in one way or another supports it. Now, the key thing to remember here is a uh, third, profi third party provider is down, so you don't want to swarm them with a lot of requests, but you do want to get an idea as soon as possible of when they're back up. And now as soon as they're back up, you start informing your appli the application that uh, it's okay to send requests to the third party provider. And that's what this eventually looks like. So you, you insert a circuit breaker between your front end workers and your back end workers, and uh, the front end is able to consult with a, with a circuit breaker before it goes ahead and queues up work for the background workers. Um, so why, why is this really important? This is really important because in many cases, one of the core th big things you can do is obviously have failover for the third parties that we provide. So you know, if you don't want to buy a label from, if you can't buy a label from USPS, you can buy a label from FedEx. Uh, that's not something you can do if, if USPS is down, then your entire system is down. So the first really important thing to do is to make sure you're isolating downtime of the components you're relying on from your own downtime. And as you can see, this could be a mid levels. And only at that point will you be able to, as we mentioned earlier, uh, add failover providers or do other things in your product where you can tell your customers we'll retry later for you and, and, and let you know. So you could use webhooks on that for that matter. A customer could simply post a request. You'll process it at your own time uh, whenever it makes sense, obviously, as long as, me as it meets uh, the client's needs. And you'll post a webhook back to the client. In that example, the client itself would also be a provider where if you're posting a webhook and actually waiting on their on the response, then uh, you know, if their platform is slowing down, they could actually take you down as well. So uh, it, you'll want to follow the same model with that as well. So all in all, if you put it all together with, with isolation, what you get is fault tolerance. So every time one of the third party providers is going down, you can tolerate those faults. Um, with Circuit Breaker, it gives you better, better resource utilization where you're not spending uh, cycles trying to process requests for a provider that you know is down. Uh, put them together, you have lower latency or at least uh, higher throughput. So a lot of times a client is putting up a request, sending requests and polling for the results. Or they're sending requests and actually waiting on the result. Either way, you'll have higher throughput with, with those two techniques. And eventually those two allow you to add failover uh, providers um, efficiently, which will give you higher availability down the line. Um, yeah. And that's, so we've, up, we've applied this at Chippo. Uh, I believe for um, most of our providers have their own dedicated queues and, and, uh, and workers, and hence, if any of them is down, we're, you know, we're barely affected. All we have to do is inform our customers, which is automatically taken care of at this point. Uh, and the good news is we're able to provide for all our customers better than the service that each of our providers is actually providing uh, at the moment. So yeah. That's it for me. I actually think I have quite a bit of time. I might have gone through this pretty fast. Yeah, I have like five minutes if anybody has any questions. Uh, I've got mic number six. Yep. Yeah, I, I noticed that you, you mentioned about Circuit Breaker. Are you using like Netflix hysterics? No, it's actually a, a, our own um, homegrown Circuit Breaker. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, this is... Uh, this one? Yeah. Like those kind of questions. That was good. Um, any more? Oh. We've got a few minutes. Sorry. Anyone else? Oh. No. Oh, right here. Oh, right over there. Could not be further away from my current position. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so, quick follow-up question: Why did you make your own circuit breaker? Um, Honestly, at the time, I, I think I just didn't do enough uh, research in the market about uh, what's out there. And I, was, I had I'd read about it, about it uh, in a few of the literature that I've, that I've encountered. Um, I decided to do it myself, but uh, it's, a, it's a simple concept um, once you spend enough time on it. Any more? Oh, yep. Yeah, I, again, could I swear you guys are doing this on purpose now. <laughs> Who was it? Sorry. Yes, sir. There you go. Uh, it's just a follow up on um, how the third party API, when, when it comes break up and it comes back up, 
Mm -hmm. um, how do you find out? Do you, do you have to continuously poll? Because the third party may not have any health check API. Yeah, so what we do right now is uh, we have some requests that we know are, so we've communicated with most, most third party providers that we talk to what requests are less, uh, eh, that ca cause less load on their system, but still touch their application code enough so that, so that they, uh, there would be a good demonstration of whether or not um, their system is back up. And that's what we've instrumented. So a lot of a lot of what we have right now with the providers that we use, they're quite uh, you know old school uh, APIs, so they don't really have status status health that you can check for. So some of some of our health checks are actually API calls that are um, idempotent, so repeating them is not really causing an issue. Uh, but also, most more importantly, they're not causing too much load on the third party provider we're communicating with. Okay, so we have a use case where it's kind of payment related, so we can't have any anything other than uh, you know payments go through. So in that case, you know, what do we do? So for payments, uh, so for payments, obviously, you can't you know charging is not something you want you want to stay away from. Um, some some of the APIs that you could try is adding adding um trying to add a a payment type and seeing if uh, if you're getting an application application error level level error or or a, uh, or a load balancer level error. Uh, if you're getting an application level error, at least your request is being processed by the application. Give you some idea. And obviously, something else to take into account here is not just uh, what the response codes are, but also how much time is it taking. Nice. Um, so if it's, if it's going past the timeout uh, period that you have, then obviously it's not, it's not succeeding. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's in the lines of, you know, what are we doing now? Thank you. Sorry? Okay. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Um, any more questions? Nope, going once, going twice. Um, big round of applause, please. Um, Thank you, everybody. And that concludes our um, microservices track. I uh, hope you've all enjoyed it. Um, like I said, more resources on everything you've kind of learned here at developer.cisco.com um, if you're inclined, a uh, load of learning resources to check out and uh, enjoy your break. Thank you very much.